So what about prayer and praying for lay people? Well, in this case, we go to the book that I mentioned earlier to Christian Conduct, addressed to Her Royal Highness Madame de Guise. Who was Madame de Guise? She was Elizabeth Marguerite, Elizabeth Marguerite of Orléans, of Orleans, and she was born on the 26th of December, 26th of December in the year 1646. And she was one of five children, and the family intended that she would, in fact, go into the religious life and to become, they intended that she should become the abbess of a particular uh, abbey, a rather lax abbey, I might add, at the time, and she was raised in a convent. This is a time when um, nuns, were well, sometimes nuns of the nobility, uh, were made abbesses, whether they were worthy of it or not, and some of the women's abbeys at this time were really just exclusive um, uh, hotels for daughters of uh, rich and noble families. Anyway, uh, she was intended to become an abbess, but she did not, because in uh, May in 1667, when she was 21, she married Louis-Joseph de Lorraine, who was a duke, the Duke de Guise, G-U-I-S-E. He was also the Duke of Angoulême, but he was the titular head of the House of Guise, a very important noble house, high up in France, related to the royal family. Hence, uh, when she became the wife of the Duke, she became Her Royal Highness, Her Royal Highness. And she became Madame de Guise, and as Madame de Guise, she was known in France from this time onwards, right down to the time of her death. She was, I mentioned her to before, in fact, in my earlier conferences, though not by name, she was extremely conscious of her position as a royal highness. Uh, she expected deference and invariably got it. Um, she treated her husband, who was of a lower social rank, in fact, than she by birth. She treated him despicably, and he had to stand when she came into the room at dinner and wait until she sat in a chair when he would offer her her napkin, and then she would give him a sign to indicate that he may sit at his own table. She was, she was, I think she must have been a very dreadful woman, but she was extraordinarily pious, and she was the one who only Ronce, only Ronce could have really controlled. Astonishing woman. But she had a sad life. She had a sad life. Um, she and her husband, the manager, the manager was not particularly happy. It was not happy for reasons I've just uh, hinted to you. Um, but uh, they indeed had a child, one, one boy. Uh, but the boy, too, the boy was sickly. And the, 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 it was, it was, the whole business, the whole marriage was fraught by tragedy because uh, her husband, the Duc de Guise, uh, visited England, the court, actually the court of Charles II, uh, where he contracted smallpox and he came back to France and he died in July 1671. So they'd, they'd been married for just over four years. It was a short-lived marriage and an unhappy one. And the one child they had, François Joseph de Lorraine, he too came to an, an unhappy end. Uh, he was always a sickly boy. He had great, he had great difficulty even in walking. Uh, actually, we know at the age of four, he still couldn't walk unaided. He had to be carried around by a nurse. And on one occasion, one terrible day, the nurse dropped him and he landed on his head and he suffered a serious injury and he died a short time later. It's a tragic story. And his mother, Madame de Guise, was understandably devastated. She had lost her husband to smallpox and her beloved son, on whom she doted, to an unfortunate accident with the nurse. And if she was devout before the child's death, she became even more devout after it. And she gave herself up to what at the time was regarded as good works. And she was recognized for her 
uh, for the good work she did, but also <laughs> combined with that, she would do good works to those who recognize her position and who defer to her as her royal highness. She split up her time between um, uh, Alençon, which is in the north, close to La Trappe, and the royal car court at uh, Paris. And when she met Rancé, is unclear. We don't know when she in fact met uh, Rancé, but met they did. Uh, as I say, Alençon and La Trappe are not far apart, just a few miles apart. And she visited La Trappe on numerous occasions with her retinue, of course, with a whole retinue. Usually just stayed a day or two, a night or two, never very long. And uh, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that between herself, the Madame de Guise and Rancé, there was a real affection. We have very, very many letters uh, between them, lots of letters between them. And there really was a real affection between them. And she was the one whom, who Rancé could say, look, you have to be less proud and she would say yes it didn't necessarily work immediately but uh, only Rancé had the charisma to deal with Madame de Guise anyway alas she was she herself was, was doomed she contracted cancer cancer of the breast I think if I remember rightly and she died in 1696 she was just 40 nine years old. So it's a sad life. It's a sad life. But Rancé addresses to her, she, she is his, uh, he is her spiritual director, and he addresses to her this book, The Conduite Chrétienne, the Christian Conduct Address to Her Royal Highness Madame de Guise. And Madame de Guise is going to undertake a retreat and she asked Rancé for guidance, and Rancé says, well, one of the, he gives a, a, a number of points which are important, but he says one of the most important is you have to learn to pray. You have to learn to pray. So to help you th do this, I will give you some advice. There are various sorts of prayer. There are various sorts of prayer, he says. But let me tell you, first of all, you might say that prayer really isn't necessary. Why not? Because God, who knows everything, knows what we need. He does. God knows. He knows perfectly what we need. But, says Rancé, he likes to be asked, which is fair. God knows what we need. Same is true today. God knows exactly what he needs, but he likes to be asked. But, he says, but if we got what we asked for too easily, too easily, we wouldn't, we wouldn't appreciate it. We wouldn't respect it. And so God, therefore, what God wants us to do is to keep asking him. God likes us to repeat in our prayers what we think we need, what we think we need. We might not. But what we think we need, we have to importune him, we have to push him, we have to pray continually to get what we need. And if we don't get what we need, it wasn't what we need. That's what Rancé says. So don't hesitate to importune God. There's the, the scriptural passage, uh, the scriptural parable about this one, of course, as you know. Don't hesitate to repeat yourself, ask and ask and ask and ask. But if you don't get it, that's because God knows what you need, not necessarily what you want. All that we are and all that we have, says Rancé, comes from him. And so your business is to open yourself to God rather than beseeching him. But nevertheless, prayer is essential and God does like to be asked. Prayer, he says, stimulates our faith in God and prayer and faith. Faith is the beginning of salvation. So prayer leads to faith and faith leads to salvation. Now, he says, let me be more down to earth. Let me be more practical and tell you about prayer. There are, he says, four types of prayer. Now he's talking to a lay woman, a devout and pious lay woman, not religious. This is important. There are four types of prayer. Mental prayer, 
short and frequent pair, vocal prayer, and this is really important, the prayer of action. Mental prayer, short and frequent prayer, vocal prayer, and the prayer of action. Let's say a word or two about them, each one of these. Don't say a lot. Uh, in fact, I actually translated the whole of Rancé's uh, uh, discussion of prayer to Madame de Guise, and if those are interested, you can read it in uh, Cistercian Studies Quarterly. But this is very a brief, a brief summary with a couple of little additions. For Rancé, mental prayer meant what he calls mental prayer and contemplation, the same thing. By contemplation, he just means what we would perhaps call meditation. He doesn't mean the deep absorption, mystical absorption in God, which some of the mystical writers reserve for the term contemplatio, contemplation. He just means, uh, he means using our mind and our brains to ponder the nature of God, to think about God, and to go as far as we can go with our human intelligence in understanding God. It's not a mystical contemplation of God, because as you know, Rancé does not encourage mystical flights of fancy. He has no interest in this. He is far more down to earth than that, just like Baldwin of Ford. But what he says is this prayer, mental prayer, what he calls mental prayer, is a stirring of the heart to God. And, he says, it doesn't just arise from your brain. It comes from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in order, therefore, to pray mentally, for mental prayer, you have to be able to detach yourself, remember the importance of detachment, detach yourself from the things of this world in order to let the Holy Spirit speak to you, to speak through you, so that your prayer can ascend to God in the words of the Holy Spirit rather than your own words. This is mental prayer. So it involves also the desire on our part to unite our will to God's will and in so doing, to eradicate our own self-will, our own self-love, and restore in us, as far as possible, the image of God. To do this, as I said, involves detachment from the things of this world. And Rancé is, in fact, here quoting his famous, his friend, St. John of the Ladder, the second step, the Ladder of desire, of Divine Ascent. And he quotes, uh, he quotes uh, John uh, Climacus in this case because John says in a splendid little phrase, I'm quoting John Climacus, it's impossible to look at the sky with one eye and the earth with the other. In other words, says John Climacus, you've got to choose God or the world and you can't look up and down at the same time. I can't. I tried several times. I couldn't make it. Can't do it. You can't look up and down at the same time. And this is what Rossi says. That's the way it is. So that's it. You have to empty yourself. You have to open yourself to the Holy Spirit. And that's what mental prayer involves. And he says, I quote him, this sort of prayer, this type of prayer is completely from God. From God. Does it mean that everybody can do it, therefore? Does it mean that you, Madame de Guise, and all the rest can do it? No. You may not be able to. You may not be able to do it. Not everybody can do it. Not every lay person can, is able to detach themselves from the things of the world around them, particularly those as rich, wealthy, powerful, and proud as Madame de Guise. You may not be able to do it. You may not be able to do it. And if you can, how long it will ask, how long it will last, when it will occur, you have no idea. It's up to God in the sense of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit blows where it listeth, it blows where it wants to. If God decides to act, then how he acts, for how long he acts, is entirely up to him. Your mental prayer, your absorption in God, if you like, your absorption in God may be short or long. 
We don't know. And then, in fact, in the uh, in his letter in the book to Madame de Guise, he suggests a number of ways in which you might recognise how God is working on the soul if he decides to do so. But if this one, mental prayer, is not, we try, we can do what we can, but mental prayer, being absorbed in God, is something which is a matter for God in the person of the Holy Spirit. No, you may not be able to do it. We may not be able to. It's very different from the mental prayer of St. Therese of Avila, but I'll say a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. So mental prayer may not be possible. It's ideal, it's great, it's wonderful, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit and we can't guarantee it. But number two, short and frequent prayer, that's possible for everybody. By this, he means what the, uh, what the Catholic Church used to refer to, or still refers to as ejaculatory prayer, those outbursts of prayer, these, those outbursts of prayer that come straight from the heart and are not dependent on any, any particular time and uh, place. They are the bursts of, of affection for God, the bursts of love for God, the bursts of praise for God, the bursts of adoration for God, which just explode from the heart at any time and place. And those may come to anybody at any time. And in fact, I think one can't help it that for those of you who know that wonderful 14th century English mystical treatise, The Cloud of Unknowing, which is a wonderful little book, um, talks in the, in the 37th, 38th chapter, they talk about short prayer. This is the prayer here, the short prayer that pierces heaven. And um, Rance likens these short, fervent prayers, these short bursts of prayer, like he says, a dart or a flaming arrow that can penetrate God's own sanctuary. And that is exactly, in fact, what the 14th century mystic says, whoever it was who wrote the cloud of a knowing, that these short bursts, these short prayers are like a spear, and are the path of the arrow that uh, pierces God's very, God's very sanctuary and lets us in. That is possible to anybody. That is possible to anybody. As is number three, vocal prayer. Vocal prayer and vocal prayer is what it says it is. Prayer spoken out loud, which is the most common form of prayer. This is the customary practice of the church, says Ronsay. And Ronsay reminds Her Royal Highness that it has to be accompanied by the right intention. You have to have the right intention behind vocal prayer. It has to be for I say, a godly purpose for a divine intention, for the right intention. It is not your business to pray for the destruction of your enemies. That's up to God. It has to go with the right intention. If it doesn't have the right intention, says Ronsay, it is no more than noise. No more than that. And he makes it clear that vocal prayer is not of the same height, not of the same depth not of the same richness as what he calls mental prayer he says so but it has a great advantage he says quite specifically it has a great advantage everybody can do it which is not the case with mental prayer which is not available to every not everybody can do mental prayer but everybody can do the short prayers everybody can do the vocal prayer but when we come to the prayer of action prayer of action, then it becomes interesting because then it links up with what we've already been saying about Ransay's approach to prayer for his, uh, in his uh, address to the religious. He, he returns his discussion in De La Santite on the holiness and duties of monastic life because he says living the Christian life, he's talking to a lay person, living the Christian, not just the monastic life, but living the Christian life in its fullness, according to the instructions given us by Christ himself in the uh, scriptures, in the gospels, living the Christian life in its fullness may be regarded as continual prayer. We saw that earlier. But living the Christian life in its fullness, he says, also demands that we make every effort 
to conform our will to the will of God. And how can you do that, he asks Madame de Guise, by overcoming self-will and self-love, you proud and haughty woman, by reducing your egocentricity, you proud and haughty woman, by reducing your sense of good self, you proud and haughty woman, and that's the only way in which we can, as you know, ref uh, restore the lost likeness and let the image shine out once again in us. And then he goes on to show how, how suggest how Madame de Guy should conduct her day, uh, and a day in which whatever she does, her duties to her household, her duties to her servants, of which she had many, her duties <laughs> to everybody, how they should be started off by a prayer to God, that uh, God should bless them, and that God should bring them to a proper ending, as it is said in the rule of St. Benedict. But it's once again doing what you are supposed to do, doing what you're required to do, doing what you should do with God in mind. The prayer of action. So living the Christian life with God in mind is prayer. As we said before, life is, or more precisely, life should be prayer. So let me now, finally, try to draw together this whole thing. What Ronsey has to say about prayer to everybody, whether they be lay people or whomever. And there are a number of points. First of all, what he says is really down to earth, and I would suggest sensible and humane. Ronse does not expect and does not desire his readers or listeners to ascend the mystical heights, uh, those Himalayas of the soul described by Bernard of Clairvaux, for example, in the De Diligendo Deo, the fourth stage of De Diligendo Deo, or in much more detail by, say, St. Therese of Avila. And indeed, John of the Cross, as you know, they, they enter up, they go up, they beyond, and then we're in the world of light entering light and white and wine entering water, becoming light water, and candle flames merging together and union. And Ransay says, nothing has no time for this whatsoever. Get out in the fiddle fields, pick up the apples, dig the trenches with God in mind. That's what we're concerned with here. Uh, for Teresa, for Teresa, mental prayer, she uses the term mental prayer, is only a way to what she calls the prayer of union. Oh, oh, oh and we're back up there. People love to ponder this. Stuff. That's what people like today. Ah, oh, mystical rapture. Ah, oh, ecstatic experience. Ah, oh, altered states of consciousness. And Ransa has no time for this whatsoever. No time for this whatsoever. None. Mental prayer for him is a very different matter. It is opening oneself to God and waiting for God to speak to one. But as I said, it's not within everyone's grasp, not within everyone's grasp. And for those who can't pray in this way, as we've seen, Ranse offers other alternatives. He offers other alternatives. Nor does he, but he doesn't set down golden rules, so he doesn't set down sets of rules for them. I would suggest some ways which may be useful to you, he says, but if these ways don't work, don't use them. Opens it up the Holy Spirit. He blows where he will, and he will do what he will. You pray the best way for you. But above all, and this brings back something I was talking about in an earlier conference, but most of all, the rule of St. Benedict is not a rule that emphasizes private prayer. What I've been talking to you about here, he says effectively, is prayer on your own. What I've been talking to you about here is prayer from your own heart at your own time, in the watch, night watches or whenever. But that is not what our business is in the Cistercian tradition. Our business is prayer in community. As we saw last time that Mother Bernard Payne said back in 1937, is the prayer of the community 
as members of the whole body of Christ, both alive and dead. That's the key. Private prayer is not vitally important in the rule of St. Benedict. Liturgical prayer, communal prayer, is far more important, far more significant. And if you pray, do the liturgy, the opus dei, the work of God, with God in mind, that is continual prayer. That is continual prayer, says Francais. That's the key. We are not talking about here about an individual, idiorhythmic, idiocentric prayer method. We are saying, yeah, you can pray on your own, and it's important to pray on your own, but nevertheless, that comes secondary to life in community and the life, the liturgical life of the, of the uh, Benedictine community, which is our participation in the very body of Christ himself. That's so important, so important. There are, as I said, these uh, other ways of doing prayer. If you're going to do it on your own, there's the short and frequent prayer, which, he says, erupts from the heart by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then again, living the Christian life is in itself continual prayer. Again, you don't have to spend... In other words, don't think that in the, in the monastic life or in the daily life, you have to necessarily set side times for prayer doing what you have to do is in itself prayer provided it's done for the right way for the right end he writes to madame de guise we must never doubt he says that the most ordinary things that we do when done in this way the correct way stand in place of true prayer if this were not so, he says, God would have given us, God would have given us a commandment that we could not possibly fulfill. In other words, the commandment to pray continually. No, just doing the ordinary things that we do when done in this way stand in place of true prayer. And the other systems, vocal prayer. Yes, vocal prayer can be useful, it can be effective, provided it's said, with the right intention. But as always, be careful for what we pray for and look at it very carefully because the Holy Spirit, it's far better to rely upon the Holy Spirit in these matters. And the best thing, the only, well, the thing that I would really, uh, the essential thing that I want to say at the end of this discussion is to remind you for the 157th time, the prayer is as much listening as asking. That's the key. And that prayer together in community is yet more important than prayer on one's own. The Prophet Muhammad said, prayer on one's own is very good, but prayer when two people do it together is 27 times better. There's a tradition attributed to the Prophet. Well, if that's the case, prayer with 12 people or 20 people, that is infinitely more effective than prayer with one alone because it is prayer in and through and with the very body of Christ himself. For we are his members and he is our head. Oh,